Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Global Radio and TV Live, and I am your host, Dr. Ravi. The number to call, 469-307-1642-1642. Well, I would like to thank our viewers in the following countries. United Kingdom, followed by USA, India, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Canada, Thailand, Japan, China, Ukraine, Korea, and Iraq. Well, you know the drill by now. If you haven't heard your country, just uh, email us. We will include you in that uh, list. Well, we here at um, Global Radio and TV Live, we talk about all kinds of subjects, conspiracy theories and controversial topics. And uh, as a scientist, I like uh, something that is more scientific in many of our discourses. Here we have discussed about existence of God. Uh, you know, nothing is more controversial in some people's mind. And aliens, not the illegal aliens, but uh, who actually exist among us, but the real aliens, uh, space aliens. JFK assassination, I'm here in Dallas, so that's a big topic. And uh, national debt, we are going to talk about that next week, where somebody is going to tell us that why national debt is good for America. Okay, that's another topic. All are controversial and conspiracy theories based. And uh, today, ladies and gentlemen, our topic has nothing to do with any of those. We have a real live person here, our featured guest, Tracy Montoya. She is going to talk about her life's experience and how her life's experience has given her the ability and the experience and a determination to change or help other people's life and help other folks you know all around the world Tracy welcome to global radio and TV live thank you dr. Ravi I appreciate the invite and I'm excited for our conversation today okay Tracy there is a there seems to be a slight problem so what we have is your video is frozen so what you could do you know we'll take it easy uh, just to take it off and bring back in, in and uh, now there you are, perfect, very good. <laughs> so, you know, the, all these uh, scientific technological problems are getting worse by the day, and uh, those who are not trained in this area are uh, having all the problems. Sometimes, I, I don't know about you, Tracy, when this problem actually happens, I go through a PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a lot of friends that are astrologers, and they always warn me, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, Mercury is in retrograde. I don't know what that means, but yeah. I do know it means I'm going to have some computer issues. So, <laughs> so the Mercury, you know, Mercury is in retrograde means the computer issues. Is that what they're saying? Yes, for about <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> well, you know, it seems to be, in, it's about three weeks ago, my problem with my computer started. I don't know why that is. And I've, I don't think that I'm going to blame it on Mercury. I <laughs> think I have to blame it on myself. Maybe it's a coincidence. That's right. All right. Well, let's get back to you. You know, you in your uh, write-up, I need it, said that any of our audience, if they want any assistance with the relationship, career, family, money, balance, spirituality, or everything else, and the whole, whole lot of things, you can help them. First of all, let's go ahead and tell our audience exactly how you are going to be helping them and what are your area of, areas of expertise? Well, I, I think a lot of my expertise comes from basically living the experience, basically living, you know, from childhood on. So I tend to work with people who have a lot of traumatic history, traumatic history, just because of the trauma, just because of the trauma, you know, whether it's sexual assault, sexual abuse, or being a victim of a crime, being a victim of a crime, you know, anything that type of PTSD type, you know, experience is who I tend to work with the most. However, I do work with pretty much anybody from seven years old all the way up to adult. And one of the areas that I tend to get a lot of is I, I do end up with a lot of people who have PTSD from the war itself. Uh, and it's, it's, it's great to work with them because my dad and myself were both uh, enlisted. And so I do have some experience of being, um, you know, serving my country and, how, and what that's like. Um, so I do end up with that. I end up with a lot of people who have uh, sexual trauma in their past. 
Um, I end up with a lot of people who have addictions, whether it's addiction to food or gambling or, you know, drinking or some, or even sex for that matter. Um, pretty much, you know, it's all wrapped into, you know, all of our behavior is wrapped into what we've already gone through. So it, when we're feeling stuck and we're feeling unhappy, you know, it's not a shame to, to ask for help. Uh, we're not meant to do this alone. We're, we're a human species. We're meant to have that collaboration. Okay. Coming back to your uh, background, you know, you know I was uh, uh, watching this particular video. So I think we will show our audience uh, what this video talks about. It is about you. By the way, this show is all, the, the entire show is about you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, at least I'm aware of people talking about me. That's good. <laughs> all right, let's, let's listen to this particular I'm video. sure you've heard of Tracy Montoya, but you may not realize that she spent decades as a victim of severe bullying as a child and teen, was imprisoned for three years by her husband, survived a stalker for 10 years, and outsmarted a hired gun. In fact, you may not know that she endured decades of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse and survived seven suicide attempts before the age of 17. All right, you know, I see, you know, right now that lady talked about, uh, it, it's like falling on me like a ton of bricks. All right. So you need to tell our audience, how did you survive this? What exactly happened? Why did you make so many suicide attempts? And, and everything else. Let's let's start with that. So what happened when you were young? Well, you know, as I remember my, my earliest traumatic memory was three years old. And I remember waking up from a nap um, and having a gun to my head. Um, it was my father and my mother, you know, begging him not to do something so stupid. And he kept saying, well, you're never going to see her again. And I don't know what the argument was about because I was only three, but I remember that cold feeling on my temple, the metal feeling. Um, I remember, you know, finally my mom threw her hands in the air and said, well, then just do it and walked out of the room. And then my dad left and followed her. Um, and that had happened several occasions uh, for about a two year span. Uh, but then I remember the very last time um, I was about five and there was something different this time. I, I woke up, I felt it. I woke up from, from my nap and there was something different about my dad's eyes at that time. I, I can't even explain it. I just felt, I felt it internally. It, there was a different feeling that I had, had ever experienced with that. And so I got up and I ran into the restroom and I shut the door and I sat on the toilet and then moved to the edge of the tub and I was just shaking. And all of a sudden I hear, you know, my mom and my dad arguing outside. I don't know what it's about. I'm terrified. And all of a sudden I hear a bang and the bathroom door is kicked in on me. And I crawled into the bathtub and I grabbed the shower curtain and I wrapped it around me and I, I literally sh was shaking. And um, he disappeared after that. My mom said she was calling the cops. I remember that. The next thing I remember is I woke up, was woke up the next morning by my mother to go to school. And I had been there all night in that tub wrapped in that shower curtain. So that's the first one I remember. Is this a, is that, that, that age, happened again. is that at the age three? It started at age three, and went to age five. I was in kindergarten when it stopped. Uh, why did it stop? My mother, Apparently after that last time and me shaking in the tub, my mother had told me when I went to school that day, it will never happen again. And I later found out, you know, as I was an adult and I was processing some of this with my mother, she said that she had told him it, that gun needs to disappear today. Uh, and, and she said, I don't know where it went. I don't care where it went, but it never came back. And so that's all that was really ever talked about much about that. Uh, my dad, never would talk about it with me. Um, it was just, it was a weird dynamic. It was a weird uh, place to be at such a young age. Now, did they, were they, did they keep their marriage for a long time or uh, did they divorce? Yes, they were married up until my father passed away in 1996 and then my mother passed away in 2007. So they were married 40 something years and they and they hated each other and, and, and they argued. I don't remember a, a night ever that they weren't arguing, going to sleep without hearing them argue. I don't ever remember one of those. 
so going back to that video you the video talks about other other kind of abuse now all these abuses came from your father or other people involved um my father was uh that you know he he's the one with the gun he's the the one with the sexual abuse um he he was those and my mother was more of the emotional mental abuse um but i also was abused by peers and um you know, the bullying and I was sexually assaulted by peers, uh, repeatedly. It, it, it was, um, it went on until I left home at, at 17. Wow. My goodness. This looks like a bad prescription for anybody. Yeah. Um, it was rough. It was very rough. Okay. So the suicide attempts before the age of 19, is that correct? There were 16. Six, 16. There were seven there were... before age 17. And my first one was at not, age nine. What happened at age nine? It was it was really just a combination of everything that had been going on because I, I, you know, I had the gun incident until I was in kindergarten. From kindergarten on, literally until I graduated high school, I had bullying. And back then, it would have been, you know, I graduated high school in 1982. Well, in 1981, I was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is a form of autism. And it was brand new at that time. Nobody knew what that was. And so I can, I can look back now on why I was teased and why I was bullied to a certain extent. Not that I justify it, but I, I did do a practicum in a high school in a special education department where a lot of the kids were diagnosed with Asperger's or autism and, and they were bullied and picked on as well because they are, let's face it, different than um, the status quo. And so when I look back, I can see how nobody knew that that was even in existence. It didn't exist at that time when I was a child. So I can see why I appear different and why my behaviors probably um, led to the bullying. Yeah, well, you know, it doesn't that, make it easier to survive it. <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah, really, there, there is no reason for them to bully. But I would right. think that, um, you know, the bullying is the number one cause of all kinds of trauma among the young adults and teenagers and leads to all kinds of tragedies, including, you know, the Col Columbine shootings and everything else. But right. anyway, no, not, with, not without going back there, you know, the first one was at nine years old, your suicide attempt. And then right. the last one was when you were 17 years old. Is that correct? Yes. And what happened then? It was just a combination of a lot of things. Um, I just, I always, I was an only child. I had parents that were entrepreneurs. They were very successful entrepreneurs, but um, I, I didn't have the attention that I wanted. They, my parents were the type of people who, if they thought that I was upset, they would buy me, you know, $2,000 worth of new items. And I, I didn't want material items. I wanted, I wanted to be accepted, and I wanted to know that I was okay, and I wanted support, and I wanted validation for my emotions. But when you're a kid, you don't know how to articulate what it is you're missing or what you would like. Right. And so I, I just felt very isolated. You know, I had no friends. I had parents that ignored me. Um, it was me and my animals all the time. I just felt very isolated and alone, and it was a very dark, sad place to be. Well, you know, that's a, that's really difficult childhood to grow up like. So I do understand the, the, the trauma that you have gone through. But what I don't understand is, how did you come out of it? Yeah, you know, it, it's when I look back, it, it, now I can look back and say it's almost like it was somebody else's life. You know, ah. I, I can look, because I've healed, so, I've healed all that. So okay. it, it, I've been able to detach from that in a way that I'm not triggered by it anymore. But, but what happened was um, at the age of 11, I started learning forensic handwriting analysis. Okay. Now I thought I, I, it was a distraction for me because I was like, okay, I finally have something that I know how to do that not everybody else knows how to do. You know, I, I wasn't really good at it because I was learning like, you know, age appropriate things, but I thought it was really cool. And so I tried to use that as a, an icebreaker for some uncomfortable situations that I was in with peers and with adults and different people. So I was then shortly, my parents were like, you know, people already think you're weird. 
don't don't dare you know tell anybody that you're learning this and they were very ashamed of every move that i made towards my life and so i wasn't allowed to talk about it i wasn't allowed to do anything about it um so i just kept learning quietly as i could and then uh you know when i was old enough to understand the dynamics of people to a certain extent um after my my seventh attempt when I was 17, the man who was teaching me the forensic handwriting analysis, he said to me, he says, I know you have a hit list of everybody that's done you wrong. And I really did, Dr. Ravi, I had a, a hit list of everybody who hurt me. And I was said, you know what? I don't care if I spend the rest of my life in prison. When I'm old enough to drive, I'm going after every one of them. Like that's how angry I was. Who is on, who is on top of that list? Like all my, like all the people that were bullied and that bullied me and things like that. Um, all the bullies, uh, the people that had assaulted no, I'm, me. I'm not talking about uh, those. I'm talking about who is on top of that list. Is there the somebody? top of my list was definitely my father. So your father. Okay. So, so, so that means that this is much more uh, serious matter. You know, the getting bullied by somebody on this down the street or a stranger is somewhat, uh, is somewhat easier to deal with. But uh, having to be with the same household in the same roof where you are supposed to get parental love instead you got this abuse is I would imagine much more harder to take. And that was probably the main reason for all those suicide, suicide attempts. That was a lot of it. Yes. Because I, I, didn't have anywhere to turn. I, I literally feel like the, we had a lot of animals. And so I, I literally, I tell my, you know, my friends and stuff will talk about it and I'll talk about it in my workshops. And I'll say, I really believe that the animals in my life taught me about the unconditional love, because if I wanted a hug, I got it from the dog or the cat, you know, right. if I wanted to play the dog and the cat were there. Like there was always an animal there to, to take the place of what my parental roles should have been doing. So after you've gone through all this, um, I would think that it will be harder for you to establish uh, any type of relationship with anybody because you have become completely untrusting of everybody. Yes, it, it was very difficult. Um, when I was 17, you know, I, I um, this guy who taught me, he said to me, he says, you know, the best way to get revenge on these people is to become a success. Correct. And that, for some reason, that just resonated with me on a very deep level, almost a spiritual level. And to be 17 and to be so angry, that that statement that he made to me was a pivotal change in, in my mindset. After that, I said, you know what, he's right. And I, and I, went into the air force um i was uh discharged on a medical issue um uh, with which was nerve damage and I, I i wish i wish i knew if it was related to any of the abuse the physical abuse i had undergone it, maybe there was some kind of damage or something that was done but it was a medical discharge and then uh, i just i went to college and i i started college I was basically forced into a marriage of a, a man I instinctively, absolutely, 100% hated. Now, wait a minute. You were forced into a marriage. But, you know, the, the country where I come from, India, they have arranged marriages over there. So did somebody arrange this marriage? Yes and no. <laughs> it, it was more of my parents were very wealthy. And okay. so they didn't approve of anybody that I would have wanted to date. And so instead, my mother meets this military man who says, you know, oh, this is from a very upscale family. This is a family equivalent to us. Um, you know, you need to, if you want to inherit any of our, of our, you know, businesses, our money or anything, you need to marry him. And, and that was pushed on me for months and months and months. And finally, so not able say. to deal with it, I just said, fine. So it's pretty much arranged. Yeah, I, I mean, it really was. I, I, to me, I looked at it like, you know what? You guys have put me through hell for 17 years. I want everything that you have that I have coming to me. It was, it was a different. You know, keep in mind, I'm 18. Yes. And I'm pissed off. You know, and I'm like, I deserve everything that you have because you put me through 18 years of hell. I see. Now, and, do you have and, any siblings? Uh, or you know, if I have to marry somebody to get it, whatever, no big deal. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any siblings or you are the only daughter? I am the only child and so, I was adopted. Okay. 
so naturally you felt like that yeah i need to get everything i can get out of this because yeah. they have put me through hell exactly that and that's why i did it so, so now so. you are really what what age did you get married 18 oh that's very bad age i mean to too young <laughs> Yes, and he was 18 as well. Oh, that would be bad news, double, double the double dose of bad news. Yeah, it was just not good. <laughs> okay. All right, so naturally, going back to looking at your life until the age of 18, I would imagine that uh, this marriage is, at, is uh, doomed to fail. Absolutely. He, uh, I don't find out till years later after I left him that he had been diagnosed with some several major mental illnesses. He was thrown out of the military for being too violent. I mean, that's kind of unheard of. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> um, they wouldn't let him sign up again to renew his, you know, his term because he was too violent. Um, he was involved and suspected in some racial, um, some racial uh, behaviors in Florida. Okay. Um, and he was a known member of the KKK Wow. So he how did the, how did situation. your parents find him huh? that's pretty amazing yeah it was not a good situation <laughs> oh so 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 after this marriage what happened next well during that marriage I, i i ended up with he was extremely abusive so i ended up with part of my lip being torn off i was nine months pregnant with our daughter and he beat me with a vacuum cleaner um in front of my parents and my parents did not step in and do anything about it. And I asked them, I said, you know, after the fact, I said, why didn't you help? And they said it was none of their business. Wow. And I said, I am your daughter. That makes it your business. Right. Uh, and uh, they just didn't want to get involved. And uh, so it was three years of, of hell. And when he would go to work, Uh, he would padlock the windows and doors on the outside and take the phone with us because, you know, that was in the you know, 80s. There's no cell phones or anything like that. And um, so I was locked in every day. That every time he was gone, I was locked into the house without any kind of access to the outside world for three years. And finally was able to, to plan my escape and leave. But it was only after our daughter was born and he actually grabbed her by the throat and body slammed her at, when she was only nine months old. So I, I finally was able to get away from that, that marriage and you know, restarted college and ended up, oh, not really, I never went back to a, an abusive marriage, but I went into a lot of marriages that were not healthy, that I needed to, I needed to feel like I belonged. Uh -huh. I needed to feel accepted. So I, so I got involved with men or married four more times. Um, the men that were I guess, project men, if you want to say it that way, men that I felt needed me more than I needed them. Okay. And so it was, they were not health, they were not abusive, um, like the first one, but they were not healthy mm. by any means of the imagination. Wow, wow. This is, uh, this is pretty amazing stuff. I mean, it's surprising that you got through all this. Uh, how is your daughter doing, by the way? My daughter is now 28. And on her own, and she owns a house. She owns a little hobby ranch, and she's married, and she has my eight-year-old grandson, who is um, also autistic. And uh, but she's doing, she's on her own and maintaining. So that's that's, that's the important uh, that's good. part. So you have done your job much, much more, far better than what uh, your parents have done with you. Looks like it. Let's listen to this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And in 1981, she was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, but didn't find out about it until 2007. Yes, her story may sound like a movie, but her experiences are very real. As a result of these painful experiences, in 1987, she became the first person in world history to create a combined handwriting and therapy program. By using her handwriting formation therapy process and combining it with her doctorate level of education and over 18 years working in the psychology field, she has created the Self-Evolved Victory Program. Just as these tools helped her, they can help you too. While we're okay, well, you know, after going through all this, you went back to college. So what, uh, what programs did you study and uh, what educational degrees you got after this? Well, I ended up um, 14 years. I'm finishing my 14th year of college right now. I have three classes left, and it will be my second master's degree. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, at age 13, I knew I wanted to 
go into psychology. I think part of it was like as many that study that field, they want to understand their own evolution, so to speak, their own experiences, the people who have done them wrong or they felt they've done them wrong. They go into it to try to understand it all and make sense of it all. Okay, and cool. so I was no different. I did that. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in forensic psychology. I have my, I'm working on my master's degree now in forensic psychology with an emphasis in criminal justice. Uh, and I also have a master's and a doctorate from, uh, on holistic psychology, which is from a school that was based in India, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. Very good. So you, so you went through all those studies now under your, your interest in handwriting. When did that start and who started it? And at, at age 11, it was my birthday gift to start learning handwriting, uh, age appropriate information. So it was just a little bit, you know, of handwriting each year until I was old enough to really comprehend. But it was a guy named Charles Stahl. I ended up calling him Uncle Charlie. He was a friend of my father's and he ran a San Francisco based school of handwriting studies back in the 60s. So that was before I was even born that that started. So you can imagine in the 60s and in San Francisco, you know, kind of the hippie days and having the handwriting and stuff going on. You can imagine some of the outrageous stuff that was coming out at that time. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I started learning from him and he's the one that said, you know, the best revenge is to be a success. And it was him that I literally feel like I owe my entire life to this point too. Okay. See, the handwriting and handwriting analysis from a criminal justice point of view or any other predictive point of view uh, or, or finding out what type of person somebody is, that's one thing. But what I noticed in your uh, work is how do you heal someone by changing their handwriting? That is completely new to me. So yes, tell our audience about what you can do with handwriting then how do you go into this therapy program where you actually help them solve some of their problems by changing their handwriting? Uh, could you, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, part of the way that I healed and how the program actually was developed, the handwriting formation therapy program, how, how it was developed was as I was living in this abusive relationship with my first husband, I had... I was locked in all the time. So I had 24 seven to write and draw and I was always very creative. So I would always do a lot of journaling and I was, I started piano lessons at age four. So I was always writing music and I was, you know, doodling and I was always doing something with a pen and paper. I started writing um, my, you know, a lot of my emotions and my feelings and things down. I started journaling which as you know, is no secret in the, the, the field of therapy or psychology. And I realized as I was doing it, I, I felt better to a certain extent, but then sometimes I would actually feel worse after I did that. And I noticed that it wasn't an emotional worse, it was more of a physical feeling. Um, and so I started paying attention to my letters and I literally would sit and, and for a day write all A's and just experiment with different A's. And then when I found one that felt really good or some that felt really healthy, I would, I would, you know, put those in a separate area. And the ones that made me feel really crappy, I would put those in a separate area. So I would do that with the entire alphabet. And so until I found an alphabet that made me feel really, really empowered. And when I did that, and I stuck, I stuck to those letters and just started writing those letters, I, I literally felt myself getting stronger and that's how I ended up making my escape plan from this brutal marriage. And I have that all in place and, and I, I was stronger than I'd ever been. I had felt, I felt very different than what I had ever felt before. And so I ended up uh, using that until I escaped. Once I escaped from that marriage, and was able to literally divorce him and be completely legally and every other way free from him. I saw a, uh, an ad for a co-facilitator position for a men that batter group, mm. okay, a therapy group. So I contacted the psychologist who was in charge and, and I said to him, I would like that position. He said, are you crazy? He said, these are men that abuse women and you want to be the co-facilitator? I said, well, let me explain to you. And, and at this time, I'm 21. So let me explain to you my reason for that. 
And so I explained to him briefly my background and my experience having been a domestic violence victim. And I said to him, I don't want to, to hate all men. I don't want to always feel this sense of mistrust toward any male gender. I, I just, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to live my life like that. And I said, you know, I want to understand that side. I, I, I won't even say anything. And he said, well, let me, he said, let me tell you what, let me see if I can talk to the group, see if they allow you to come in and maybe sit in here and there. I said, okay. So in the meantime of him checking on that, it, it was, you know, a couple of weeks went by. In the middle of that, I went to the domestic violence shelter and I said, look, this is the program that I, that I created based on my own, you know, trying to escape from this experience. I said, I would like permission to try this with any other domestic violence victims that are willing to do this, you know, no cost. I just want to do it for statistical purposes. And she took my information. She, you know, met with her higher ups or whatever she needed to do. So in the meantime, I have about a month and a half of this waiting time, right? And I'm just on the edge of my seat because I, I just want to get going. And um, so finally, the the uh, psychologist for the men that batter group, he called me and he said, they said that you're willing to sit in on every single one of them, but you can't speak or roll your eyes or do anything that would be constructive sued as judgment of them. Okay. I said, okay, agreed. So I did that for a year. And at the same time, I did put the domestic violence victims through the handwriting therapy program. And at this time, it's still not copyrighted. I'm still experimenting. I'm still tweaking and developing. So after a year of doing both of those with great success, I literally felt that I don't have any more hatred or mistrust toward men. I felt that I could go into another relationship of some kind without having to be in fear. So at, and at that the same time, the, the domestic violence victims were doing well too. So, uh, so at that time, uh, what did you do with your hit list? Did you throw it away? I had thrown it away right after um, Uncle Charlie told me that you, you know, the best revenge is a success. I literally shredded it right after that. Oh, okay. Well, so, then let's uh, let's get back to your handwriting. Now, you also do a handwriting analysis. Now, mm -hmm. now you have now, ladies and gentlemen, I had sent my handwriting to Trace, Tracy, and uh, she had looked at it, and she's going to tell us now. Don't uh, don't hide anything. Tell our audience, what did you find out about me? Um, I actually don't have a copy of it in front of me. Oh, do you, you don't want have to read it? it? I. Well, I do have it here. <laughs> so, well, the first sentence you are saying is you are able to get along with basically anyone, but do not trust just anyone right away. So now these things, these particular ones, you know, say, for example, that particular sentence. Yes. Uh, what in my writing or the style of writing gave you that idea? Well, um, for the first one, for, for the first part where it says you're able to get along with anyone, um, you have vertical writing. It's pretty much straight up and down. So that's that indicator. Okay. But when it says that you um, don't aren't really quick to trust just anyone, the spacing between your words is pretty wide. Spacing and between so words are that. pretty wide. Yes, that is correct. And as a matter of fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look and show it to you what I sent to... Uh, how do you say your name, Trace or Tracy? Tracy. Tracy. You're right, Tracy. Tracy. So this is what I sent, folks. This is how it looks. Well, let me. Well, let's change it to the other camera. There you go. All right. Now you see there. There is something there, and then there is some some stuff in the bottom. It's not very clear. Well, you know, the, you, the audience may not be able to see it uh, in, in in straight away, right? But uh, what is most amazing to me was that you were able to. Uh, actually read through my writings. Now here is some of the other writings and I got a uh, page full of writings like this. Um, what I found was that you were able to do the analysis within five minutes. So is that all it takes? Well, I mean, this is called what I call a quickie analysis. Um, so it's a quick snapshot of something. Uh, of course, I have to type it up. So maybe about five <laughs> oh. total. But um, but they're just a quickie snapshot. So they're, they're, they're a great, a, a great thing for people who are, are not quite ready for the full profile, which is about seven pages long typed. 
Um, and it's a good way of kind of getting a quick overview of somebody. Um, I have people who are dating who, who just are like, I want to know if this person has a potential to, you know, perpetrate on my kids. I want to know if somebody's potentially violent. I want to know if somebody's suicidal. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why people want a quick overview of somebody's personality. And that's what these are for. Oh, okay. So now when I, when you did this quick analysis on me, uh, what you have done is you have given pretty much uh, practically all the good news. Now, I'm not worried about uh, hearing bad news. What, are, what, what, what bad news did you find? And I don't mind if my audience come to know about it. Well, I, I just, I knew that I, I saw the, um, you know, I know that you and I had talked about it, that I had seen the, the anger and the resentment um, towards a, a male, which okay. turns out to be you being hard on yourself. And then a um, separation, which can be real or symbolic from a female, like a, a mother figure of some sort um, or ex-wife. You know, somebody who was prominent in your in your field of relationships. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Uh, yeah, separation anxiety from a prominent female. Yeah, that is absolutely right. So that that's that's right on the money. <laughs> and then I of course saw the stubborn streak, but I think that stubborn streaks are really good because a lot of people when you say, Oh, you're stubborn, people take it as a negative. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. honestly, it's really good because you people who have a stubborn streak are not as easy to be fall victim to somebody taking advantage of them. So I'm always for having at least some stubbornness in your in your personality because you don't want to be that, you know, you don't want to be that uh, the, the rug that everybody walks on. I see. Uh, you know, we have a um, we have a couple of different shows where usually I, I was the guinea pig. Because I say, okay, whatever you are going to try, before you can try on the audience, you are going to call you on this subject matter, why don't you try it on me? So that's why we did this handwriting analysis, and we were in a big hurry this morning to send this handwriting to you. I didn't send you a lot of my handwriting, but you know, you know, just for a uh, very brief analysis of what you can do. So according to you, therefore, uh, Tracy, you can actually find out a lot about somebody uh, with their handwriting and the next step which is even much more harder I think maybe not for you but for the client is to change their handwriting to change their uh, uh, connection of neurons and the neurotransmitters and everything else you know I do understand something about what you are saying because some days I noticed my handwriting is very nice I like my handwriting mm -hmm. some days I hate it <laughs> <laughs> because my handwriting is not coming out very well the way I thought to be. Some days I'm totally indifferent. I don't care how my handwriting looks. I need to get this job done. Right. But uh, going back to what you said now, I'm looking back at those days. Some days it's beautiful. Why is that? Is that a, is that a common phenomenon or am I just imagining? No, that is. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the issues that, that I have as far as the general public goes with regard to, to my work is we are, as a society, so obsessed uh, with neatness. Uh, and and it, it drives me crazy when, when, you know, I could go on Yahoo Answers, for example, or, or Google something, and I see so many people saying, you know, my, my mom is really upset with me because my handwriting is messy. And, you know, and, and you know, people talk about, uh, you know, I was I was in Catholic school and I was forced to write neat. And there's all kinds of trauma <laughs> that that's wrapped around our handwriting style, which is just completely um, unnecessary. Uh, so to answer your question in kind of a roundabout way, um, the your brain is obviously the same brain. Nobody has a lobotomy day to day, uh, but. What happens is a lot of people, based on your emotion, what you're writing about, who you're writing to, and the the item you're writing on, whether you're signing a business check or you're having to fill out a will or you're or you're you know doing something that's uh, you know a birthday card. There's there's different connotations of emotions and associations and beliefs and things that have been forming over the years with regard to that. So your handwriting automatically does an adaptation based on what the subconscious feels about that situation that's involving whatever you're writing. So, but it's really important to realize that 
you know, there are people who are in their 80s who still write exactly the way that they were taught when they were in fourth grade. And those people tend to be more unhappy and unfulfilled and kind of live a life of facade to a certain extent. For example, they'll stay in marriages that they're unhappy with because it's not societally okay to divorce. You know, back in the 40s, divorce didn't happen. Right. <laughs> you know, we, we were married. And so we stayed married and we put up with uh, infidelities and abuse and we put up with things without standing up for ourselves because that's what was expected of a woman, for example, to do. Um, so there's a lot of people who still write the way they were taught in school. And that just shows they're conforming. That doesn't mean they're genuine in who they are. So when you see somebody who writes messy, as long as 80% or more of it is legible and can be read, um, the messiness is a sign of actually being genuine and stepping into who they really are. Whether or not people like them or not, it's really about being genuine to ourselves and who we are. And that is key if we're ever going to be fulfilled and happy and reach so, our goals. So that is the reason, so since we want to be clean and neat in our writings, that's the main reason iPad and iPhone are selling. Because it's always neat and clean when you type in on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's a certain careers, too, that, that dictate that, like law enforcement, architecture, military, accounting. They tend to do a little bit more block print. And part of that is to be able to, to make sure their message is understood. But usually on the, on the outside of that, when they write personal stuff to themselves, like in college, their notes or something, they're usually messy. So it just really depends on the situation of who they're writing to and about and what they're writing on and the situation involving that. There's a lot that goes into it. So you actually now teach your um, clients as to how to change their writing to change their brain? Yes. So how, there's do, a, how does that there's work? There's a, a neurological brain connection. Um, so if, if you're walking around, say, you know, angry, there's a connection in the brain that that that, that has that you know, um, that connection, that trait is locked into you at this point. So you can go into traditional talk therapy for 20 years and never, ever completely get rid of that anger because until it's done on a brain level, on a neurological level, it's always going to have the potential to show its ugly head. And that means that those triggers are always going to exist there. So what happens is if we say, okay, we want to get rid of this anger, we can bring in something like a um, sense of humor, yeah. Something that can, um, you know, is opposite of anger uh, and, or forgiveness. And we can bring that in, train the client how to write with deliberately with the letters that represent forgiveness or, or a sense of humor. And what that does is it overpowers and creates a new neurological brain connection. And the other one is forced to die off and then gets reassigned to do something else in the body. Uh, so that's how the program works, and, and it really is on a brain uh, level, okay. the neurological connection. Okay. Well, let's, uh, that's very fascinating because I do agree with you um, in a sense that the writing has, you formed a habit of writing based upon your mental conditions, and over the years you have practiced a specific way of writing and that triggers certain neurotransmitters and neurological reactions. Now, once you are trying to force yourself to change your type of writing, now that changes the brain connection and the brain neurological uh, interactions and uh, uh, that can uh, actually change your behavior or your mood or whatever else you are suffering from. Now, do you have any, any, any scientific study that you are planning on to do on this particular matter instead of just getting uh, um, you know testimonial from patients which is really not a which is you know the testimonials are good but that uh, from a scientific peer review research that is not acceptable right so do you have it any has plans been done. there was a research psychologist um Oh my gosh, her name escapes me. On, on the website, you can download the research. She was a research psychologist and she did some research on, on the program. And then there was also a neuro uh, psych, psychiatrist, I believe he was, or a neuroscientist of some sort that did brain scan images before, during, and after. And that's all available on the website as well for people to, 
to download and look at. Um, so it has, it is evidence-based. It has been researched. The other thing was when I worked with, uh, the juvenile probation, uh, in Texas, as a matter of fact, uh, from 2000 in 2006, uh, it was it started in January and it went for the full six months. Uh, and what we did was I met with the, uh, legislative, uh, like, uh, representative and he said, you know, we have these these kids that are high recidivists, they've been in every traditional program that we have available to them through the probation department, through community corrections, and they have failed at every single one of them repeatedly, including that of medication. And so they said, you know, this is our last attempt to try to, you know, get them, you know, fixed, for lack of better words, so they don't end up in the adult, you know, prison system for the rest of their lives. So they were they were trying to do something that was a little outside the box, but had heard about my program okay, through, okay. A, through a lady named Vicki Spriggs, who was the executive director of the Texas Juvenile Probation Commission. And um, I put them all, these kids all through that. Of course, they had to want to do this. Um, I put all the kids through this uh, anonymously. I never met with any of them. I didn't know their names, their crime, their background, their location. I didn't know anything. I just worked uh, with the probation officer as a liaison. Now, after they finished the program, the state followed their, their record for five years after that, and none of them had reoffended. Wow, very good. Excellent. So there is a, definitely a positive result uh, doing, the, doing the analysis like what you have done or, and your therapeutic uh, procedures. Well, one thing that you talked about me on your handwriting analysis is depending upon my mood, okay, and if the mood is whichever way it goes, your moodiness may change your perception of things. Now, I found this absolutely correct. If you give me two different, same scenario, same, exactly same identical situation, but my mood is different, okay, for this, for the same identical situations, my reaction will be completely different. Right. I'm the same guy, and you are giving me the same, same situation, and I'm reacting totally differently. Now, fortunately, Tracy, I'm in a good mood, so I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> uh, all right, good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Trace Montoya is not just a therapist; she has written a lot of books. Uh, Trace, do you have any? Uh, Tracy, you have any of those books with you? I do, yes. All right, let's go over a few of those books and tell our audience what they are about and where they can find those books. Well, well, this one is actually um, the pocket guide. Um, so basically, if, if it's something that you just you don't have any experience in learning, but you would like to learn them, it's called Uncover the Truth, and it's a pocket guide. Um, but it's it's cute. It's it's great for especially this time of year because it, it, you can stuff it into you know Christmas stockings. It fits in your purse in your glove compartment. This is actually uh, created as a request from a bunch of probation officers who wanted something that was a quick snapshot when they're out in the field. So that's how this was created. But it's been a hit with the general public as well. Where can they find this book? Um, all my books can be found on either Amazon, but if you want the best deal, I suggest going to asktracy.com, um, which is A-S-K-T-R-E-Y-C-E.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can go to her website, asktracy.com, A-S-K-T-R-E-Y-C-E.com, one word. All right, what's the next we have? Um, we have this one, which is called Written Violence, the Personality Behind the Pen. And um, this actually has a lot of the writing correlations uh, from like Ted Bundy, Charles Manson, the Columbine uh, shooters, um, different well-known, uh, you know, criminals that we love to hate, so to speak, uh, and, and shows their correlation of handwriting uh, red flags that show their ability to do what they've done. And also some uh, kids and some adults on probation and 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 who have been in prison that shows the exact same correlation. So it gives you a very quick look at how these writing signs really do correlate with behaviors. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. So did anybody did uh, study some of the other famous people like Hitler and others? Yes. And there's, there's all kinds of, of people in here um, that 
there's just there's a bunch of people in here that everybody knows there's serial killers from um, around the world there's there's um you know child predators there's pretty much any crime you can think of that's violent that would be considered violent uh is in here e even down to um you know uh, armed armed robbery and things like that so it's it's uh very good book for that type of thing you know this this brings up an interesting point um you know yeah again i i'm talking about my own situation here but of course you know it's not a bad thing to bring up even though i don't even have a parking ticket in my background uh, in, if somebody does a criminal study on me they won't find anything but why am i always afraid that uh, there is something criminal that i even don't know about <laughs> <laughs> and you know yeah. i'm afraid that uh, i go and uh, tell my go to my school Uh, my son's school and then they will find out something horrible about me <laughs> <laughs> well it, it's funny because i think that 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 goes into um how you're hard on yourself you know with the with the male part of the capital i i i think that you know i i tend to be kind of hard on myself too not as much as i used to i've worked on that but there's always i'm always looking i was always at a certain time i was always looking for something that okay what am i doing wrong i'm always kind of keeping myself in check And 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 finally I was really realizing that I'm just wasting too much time trying to keep myself in check. <laughs> I don't, I don't need to do that. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I go to some shop and I was going to buy a gun. Okay, because I was going to practice shooting. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking as soon as I walk in there they said we need your social security this and that and I said why? I said uh, well you need to send it to the FBI to make sure that you don't have any background criminal activity. Right. I gave it to them and then I you know but I was afraid you know while I was standing there well they're going to find something about me and then somebody's going to come and arrest me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well maybe in your past life you were a, a criminal. <laughs> but uh, you know you never know it could be because I'm I am jumping every second uh, you know well, you know perhaps I was like that in some other life or some some other time yeah. period of my life uh, where I was never uh, never anything but I'm always afraid they're going to come up with something that I don't even know. Yeah. I I never even yeah. happened. So, have you ever heard of this kind of uh, paranoia? Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny because I have um I have uh, to give you an example, like one of the one of the common things with with people that say stuff similar to that is uh, um they have a lot of passive aggressive tendencies. And so when people have a passive aggressive tendencies, they know that. They know that they have that. And so um whether it's a conscious thing or it's not we we always there's I believe that it's every human has a potential for violence so you put it in the right circumstance put it in the right situation you know um you could have the best mom in the world right mess with her kid and she'll run you down <laughs> absolutely you know? yeah and so there's a situation that could be right for anybody to commit an act of violence I do believe that um so this so i think part of that is just that there's some awareness there knowing that you know if if the right situation comes my way i am not i am not incapable of reacting to a way that i think is is best whether it's a good or bad to anybody else i think there's a sense of awareness to you with that you have that though okay all right now let's listen to this video hi my name's heather i finished the three monkeys program with dr tracy montoya this program it builds upon work that you've already had done It's a little less intensive than some of the other programs. All right, now she's talking about um, Three Monkeys program. What is that exactly? The Three Monkeys is kind of like um it, it's kind of like saying you have monkeys on your back. You could probably carry one monkey and be okay. You know, literally if you went to the zoo and carried a monkey on your back, you'd probably be okay. If you carry two, it gets a little heavier. Carry three, it might be almost impossible. My so goodness, yes. the three monkeys is like the subconscious and the conscious and 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 then your like logical side that's all kind of wrapped into one where if you're carrying things on your back, anger, resentment, um shame, guilt, any of those things, there's three main ones that can be causing the is the other issues okay so if we are feeling angry that can cause depression that can cause addiction that can cause other things but the main thing you want to get at is that anger so three monkeys is a three month program that isolates three main problem points as as identified by the client 
And we, for those three months, work on handwriting changes to get rid of those three things. And as a result of those three major things disappearing, the little ones that are residual from those three major things also go with it. Okay. Let's listen to this. Have you ever wondered what your purpose in life was? Do you know why you are here? I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing in my life at all. I had no clue. Why did life have to be so complicated anyways? Well, those were the words I used to replay in my mind over and over for years. Thankfully, through Tracy Montoya's self-evolved victory program, I was able to answer those questions and silence the negative voices within. Okay. All right, Tracy. Now, what is this? What did what program did she go through? Now that one is when she mentioned self evolved victory program that has actually taken a name change. But what it is is now called um, the that's the new one, the Shine in Your Awesomeness, the You First program. It's actually it's actually called You First. Um, that went through a name change, but it's basically the same program. Um, this is a ten month program that combines the handwriting therapy with some inner child artwork. So a, a lot of art therapy, for lack of better words, in it um, combined with the handwriting therapy. So it's very intense of 10 months. But this is good for people who have just a lot of trauma that they've really struggled with. And um, the, you know, the residual effects of that, the depression, the addiction, the anger, the, the crappy relationships, the, you know, the self-hatred, the lack of forgiveness, the shame, the guilt, all those things. This is a really good program for that. Okay. Well, when they want to meet with you and get on these programs, how do they contact you? They just go to the same website, Ask Tracy, and then there's a, there's a quiz on there that I developed that actually shows what program would be best for their situation. So it's a very short quiz, but the, the, the questions are very, they're very, developed to really pull out things that um, they don't know that are being pulled out, so to speak. Um, so with that being said, they, they, they're told that, you know, okay, this is the best program for you, Three Monkeys or, or you know, You First or, or HFT, which is Handwriting Information Therapy. It tells them which one's better for them. And then there's a free consultation. They can just click on the schedule, the free consultation, and we can talk about how it would work for them. Now, this is developed, you know, keep in mind back in the early 80s and internet and faxing and cell phone pictures and all that stuff didn't exist. Um, it's for the average public. And so this is designed to be done at home uh, in, in your own safe space, whether home or office or a friend's house or wherever the safe space is at. And so it, it is not meant to you don't have to have the internet to be able to do these programs. All you have to have is a way of, of sending your samples and your work into me or the therapist. And then that way you can still participate. Cause a lot of the countries I work with, the people in the countries uh, have issues with, you know, they have the internet, but they're not very good connections or, or they're maybe not as technologically advanced. And so, as, as long as they can put it in an envelope and mail it to me, I can work with that even. So it's it's very open as far as being able to do the program. There's no uh, geographical boundaries. Okay. Well, you know, there is always a room for improvement. We have only one minute left. Uh, when are the, an hour has passed so quickly. Tracy, yeah. I, tell me, there is always room for improvement. Do you see any room for improvement for myself? <laughs> yes, I actually, there's one that I would really, really recommend okay. for everybody, literally for everybody old, old enough to hold a pen. The capital I is extremely important because it's the only letter in the, in the alphabet that represents only you. Right. Okay. Yes. So yeah. when you have bullying situations or people who have uh, caused you some pain or, or you've allowed to cause you some pain, um, those people hang on residually on that capital I. So every time you write the capital I, it get, it's like it's replanting the situations yes, back yes. on your subconscious. The subconscious job is to protect us, but it doesn't have a timeline. It doesn't know if it happened five minutes ago or 20 years ago. It doesn't right. have that ability. Right. 
So the best and healthiest way to make a capital I is to have one vertical line down. Okay. That's okay. it. No other lines, no loops, no nothing. Just no, one no, no, go, something going across or, uh, or nothing going across or it bottom. It looks like a lowercase L. Lowercase L. So that is the way to write I and it should be straight up and down. No, no yep. angles, no slanted. No slants, no nothing. Perfect one straight up and down line and make it tall and proud. Make tall and proud. So that will be the starting point for I getting better. Yes. Yeah. Ah, very interesting. Well, you know, Tracy, this one hour is already over. Can you believe it? You had a fantastic uh, knowledge and ideas about how to improve people's life. Uh, you know, it has been a great pleasure having you on board. It has been my pleasure to speak with you and analyze you as well. <laughs> well, we are going to do more of this as, the, as we continue along. We would like to have you come back uh, in the very near future and continue this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Global Radio and TV Live, and uh, you are also listening to our featured guest, Tracy Montoya handwriting expert and will change your life based upon how you would like to have your life changed. Our website is asktracy.com which is spelled A-S-K-T-R-E-Y-C-E.com, one word. And uh, Tracy, thank you so much and please stay on the line. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. A couple of more minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be right back.